Okay, hi there, I'm Adrian Warnock and I'm here with Esther Shaw. And am I pronouncing that right, first of all? You got it perfectly, Adrian. Excellent. So Esther, um, you are um, quite well known within uh, the world of CLL and some of the other cancers as well as um, in, in heavily involved in an organization called Patient Power. But in case anyone uh, watching this doesn't know what Patient Power is, could you just explain that for us, please, and how you kind of got involved in that? Sure. And thank you for having me, Adrian. Um, Patient Power is a website and a devoted staff of writers uh, and video producers who are dedicated to educating and empowering patients across a num patients and care partners across a number of different cancer types. Uh, patient power has been in existence in its current form uh, 10, 15 years, but my partner, Andrew, who is a CLL, patient and survivor of many, many years, we started doing patient education whew, in the late 80s, before there was the internet. And uh, we've been devoted to that work ever since. So Wonderful. Yeah. And as I understand it, he was doing that before he became unwell. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, and when, when he was diagnosed with CLL, it was kind of like, whoa, the universe is doing something strange here. So, mm. you know, we just said, well, maybe that's an indication that we need to continue what we're doing. And cool. uh, so we did. So we have. So you've got a wealth of experience, obviously, uh, both in terms of your own personal journey, but also in terms of watching other people's journeys. And I thought it'd be quite interesting to just talk a little bit about what you've seen, really, uh, what you've seen that's been helpful, maybe what you've seen that's been less helpful, um, sure. so that uh, for people, you know, in this in this journey that they face uh, with with a cancer diagnosis, on the sort of broader sense, really. Um, so it's kind of interesting this word. I mean, we've already used it once today. This word carer. And um, I must mm -hmm. admit, when I first got diagnosed, this this idea that I might have a carer was a dreadful, dreadful word. So am I a, a unique in that, or do other people feel that way sometimes? Um, well, I will tell you that early on in my role as a carer, as you say, um, I really balked at the name here, you know, in the US, we tend to call people caregivers. Mm -hmm. I hated that, just hated it. There are situations where somebody needs a caregiver, where they're fully not capable of taking care of themselves. Mm. And I said, I'm not a caregiver. I'm a care partner. And in, um, in a CLL journey, um, generally speaking, the person or persons who are around you as a patient um, are really care partners because CLL, you know, fortunately um, is one of those uh, cancers that for often for many people is not something where you can't take care of yourself in many respects, you just need people to partner with you to support you when things, when the road gets a little bumpy and you need treatment and things like that. But yeah, I think that a carer is a very, has a very specific meaning that almost um, incapacitates the person with the illness. Mm. And I don't think that that's the case normally with, mm. especially with CLL. I think there are diseases where people need a carer. And uh, so for me, it also helped me as my husband's care partner and life partner to feel like I'm not his caregiver. I'm somebody who shares the responsibility with him or go and goes through the journey with him. Mm. So. Have you noticed um, quite a difference though in how some people approach this? Because it, in my limited observation, I've noticed that some people, it seems like really that there's very little um, connection and, and someone's just get left left almost on their own devices others they're very very involved you know and they go to every appointment together and things like that so ah. have you noticed that variation as well well I think there is and some of that from what I've observed has sometimes it has to do with the patient's approach to their illness and some or their condition and sometimes it has to do with the care partner's approach to it. So example, if you're diagnosed with CLL and your approach to it is, oh my gosh, my life is over. 
I don't know what's going to happen. I am afraid. I don't know what questions to ask. And I'm afraid to ask for help and do research and embrace what the opportunity for continuing a vibrant life is, then you get isolation for the patient. From a care partner or a carer standpoint, or whatever you want to call yourself, uh, from their standpoint, it's like you have a choice. You can either communicate, I'm afraid, I don't know what this means. I want to be, or, and I'm going to back off and let the person deal with their thing. And I'm going to go on with my life. Or you can say, look, this is part of our life together, whether we're partners or we're friends or we're family, let's communicate about what we each need because each person in that group or couple or, you know, need different things at different times. So I'm not sure I answered your question, Adrian, but. No, you sort of um, did. Yeah. I mean, I guess. It, and you sort of addressed, started to address another issue in a way that is perhaps very close to related, and that's how different people approach this. And yes. I think there's a, a, a you know huge difference in, in in the way different people approach. And obviously, that's partly influenced by you know what they experience. I guess, for example, I mean, we'll, we'll have people watching this, you know, with a much more acute um, cancer background, say like a, I don't know, very acute blood cancer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that might lead you a little bit to approach it one way. Um, and if it's a very sort of early CLL, perhaps, or another chronic one, it might lead you a different way. But actually, it's not just about the cancer, is it? It's about the personality of both the individual and perhaps their family members. No, I think that's absolutely true. I mean, I, I can just share anecdotally about Andrew's and my dynamic. Andrew and I are very different people. We've been married 35 years, but, you know, opposites attract. I don't know, but um, Andrew is a very practical, let's approach the problem head on, not really emotional on the outside. I'm sure there's feelings on the inside that have to be coaxed out, but let's see what we need to do here. My first reaction in a stressful situation is, oh my God, you know, how are we going to deal with this? You know, what happens? And that was exactly what happened when Andrew was first diagnosed. And what, what did I do about it? What did we do about it? Communication, very open communication about how we're each reacting and each of us taking responsibility, especially me, for what am I going to do to be able to take the next step forward to support him, to make sure I'm healthy and that I am approaching this in a healthy way. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, and I have seen couples and families and individuals approach this very differently, but some, th some approaches are more um, constructive and helpful than others, and maybe that's something you want to explore. Yeah, so what, what do you think then? I mean, how would you categorize the different approaches you've seen? Let's put it that yeah. way. Well, there's kind of the brick wall approach, which is there's this thing we don't want in our, we just, we have this new member in the family. It's called CLL. It's this cancer. Don't know a lot about it. I don't want to know about it. I'm going to put it behind a brick wall and not deal with it. There's the approach of, wow, I better know what this is. And this is from a patient and a, a care or a care partner standpoint. We need to figure out what this is, how it impacts us together as a family, as individuals, and then figure out a path through it and find experts to help us. And then there are some people who acknowledge it and just say, oh, well, you know, I'm going to live for today and whatever happens, happens. And I, I kind of feel like the first one's not very productive, doesn't offer mm. tomorrow being very, uh, very happy or very fulfilling for anybody mm. if you just don't do anything and ignore it because it's not really something you can ignore but the other two I think it's kind of a meld of those things is the practical as well as what do you how do you want to live the rest of your life as a, a patient as a person with a chronic illness that isn't necessarily going to affect your life dramatically every single day but when it does you're going to act on it acknowledge it ask for help I think it's kind of a mix of those things. And, mm. uh, but I think there is one other thing, Adrian. I think it's really important that both patients and their care partners, carers, 
acknowledge that something's different in their life. And it's like somebody who came to visit and, you know, you give them a room, feed them if you want to, acknowledge they're there, do what you have to, to take care of it. Um, and then go on with the rest of your life because it isn't at this, you know, at that stage when you're a CLL patient, generally speaking, and I know there are exceptions, the rest of your life goes on. It's just there and there are times when it needs to be treated. There are times when it doesn't. And then as there are, if there are impacts on your life, you just kind of, here comes the curveball. What are you doing mm. about it? Mm. And that's so, kind of, Yeah. 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 So have you seen what sort of unhelpful things have you seen in that dynamic between, you know, carer and and, and patient, would you say, and vice uh, versa? I think the most unhealthy thing I've seen is lack of communication about each other's feelings. You know, whether it's somebody who's been diagnosed and they say, I'm not going to talk about it. I'm not going to deal with it. I don't want to get educated about it and I don't want your help and mm. I don't want your support. And on the other side is a carer. You know, there are times, I mean, and I'm sure people who are listening and you have heard a carer will say, oh my God, I can't deal with this and walks out. And mm. we've, seen, we've seen that not so much with CLL, but things that are more acute and are in the moment, very life-threatening. They're like, oh my God, my life is going to fall apart. I can't deal with this. But it all comes down to communication because both people or a group of people dealing with an illness, they're all impacted in some way. But if you don't talk about it and you don't come up with a way to deal with it together, it falls apart. So mm -hmm. I think lack of communication and honesty about how you feel are the most non-productive things I've seen. And oh. it's painful for some people to share their feelings, but when you get them out, then you can deal with them. Mm. And of course, there are some people, I guess, you know, um, don't really talk about their feelings very much at all. Or, or right. you know, you sort of hinted at that, um, even perhaps in your own marriage. Um, mm. But um, I wonder how you deal with that when someone just doesn't really want to talk about how they, how they feel or or perhaps actually as well, that can have another effect where there's a mismatch between perhaps one one uh, person who wants to talk about how they're feeling and the other person who doesn't, and you may even criticize that person. Say, oh, you're just being negative. Come on. Well, um, you know, it's, uh, that's a toughie. And I think that if someone has the personality of not wanting to talk about their feelings and process it internally, I don't think that that issue has to necessarily get forced. Because there are people who the way they deal with pain or with something negative is to say, I'm just going to swallow it and move on. And in a way, communicating that with the people around you is a first step to say, look, don't pressure me. I need to do this in my own time, in my own way. But then what happens, Adrian, is that the people around them need to figure out how to deal with how they're reacting to the situation. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that's the healthiest thing. I mean, if you don't at least know where the other person's coming from, um, I'll, if I can I'll tell you a personal anecdote, I've learned to say to Andrew sometimes, are you in your nothing box? <laughs> and it's a reference to something we've watched uh, on YouTube about the difference between men and women. And it's a gross, it's a gross generalization. But the theory is that men sometimes can go to their nothing box, that sometimes men are just not thinking about anything. I don't think that most women are capable of that. So, I mean, maybe there are exceptions, but there's a, there, somebody will say, oh, you're such a sexist, but I think we're wired a little differently and there are different personalities. I think there are people who simply can compartmentalize and say, this is who part of who I am, I'm putting it over here and I'm going to go on with my life and I really don't want to deal with it. And I do think that if it's somebody like that and it's a patient and it's a partner or a family member and they say, you know what, I just don't want to deal with it right now, that should be okay. But then the people around them have to accept that and communicate how they're feeling or get external help to deal with how they feel, which is what I did. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, and I'm happy to share that. Yeah. Yeah. Do tell us a little bit about what that looked like for you. Well, 
when Andrew was first diagnosed, and this was a long time ago, we had two small children under the age of six, and we were wanting to have a third child. And I completely fell apart when Andrew was diagnosed with CLL. And it was kind of the typical cancer. You're not going to treat it right now. You're going to just let it do its thing for a while and then figure out to do that's that old watch and wait, watch and worry, or what are they calling it now? Proactive observation or whatever. And I couldn't, I couldn't cope with it. And so I went and I got counseling and Andrew and I went together. And the truth is I got on it for me, getting on some anti-anxiety medication helped me because Mm -hmm. my way of dealing with it was very different than Andrew's. Andrew's was very pragmatic this is what it is. I'm going to learn about it. I'm going to reach out to other people with it. I'm going to look at who the doctors are. And once I got my act together, we did that together. Mm -hmm. But you're two individuals or you're a group of individuals and people are wired differently. And I think it's an acknowledgement of differences, but being able to confront that and say, we're different, but we each have to deal with this in our own way. And what can we do to support each other? Mm-hmm. So, what about if um, it's the other way around? If the you know the part the the sorry the patient is the one who is perhaps falling apart a bit or finding it difficult or maybe having symptoms that perhaps it's hard for the for the partner to recognise. You know things like fatigue, which can for some people be very very debilitating. Yeah. Um, and you can sometimes uh, have some. Uh, one thing that people have mentioned to me is um, sometimes. And again, not wanting to stereotype, but maybe if sorry the about that. <laughs> yeah, but if the partner is someone from a military background, for example, or right. have that has that kind of almost like kind of cheerleader type mentality, where it just kind of pull your socks up for goodness' sake, you know, just do more exercise or just do this, just do that, you'll be all right, kind of thing. And that can be quite difficult for the patient in that circumstance as well. So, have you seen that? And any thoughts on that? Well, I have seen it and heard about it and read about it. And it is difficult because again, people are wired differently um, and not dealing on either partner's side, not not dealing with that difference in approach is going to disintegrate the relationship really quickly. So if let's say my partner is, uh, well, so you're saying the person who is the patient is saying, pull your socks up. And no, the other way around. So the, other way around. Sort of the other the, way around. The other way around, yeah. Right. Um, then the patient needs to look for other support. Mm. Say, I'm falling apart. My partner is, isn't dealing with it. And I think sometimes you have to, in that situation, force the issue. Say, look, this isn't working for me. I'm in pain. Um, I need us to get together, whether it's just us or with somebody else who can reflect back what's going on. I mean, you can tell I'm an advocate for having somebody who's not intimately involved in that dynamic to look at it and say, this is the impact of your behavior. This is the impact of your behavior. How can you continue to live together and work together in this situation? Because Mm -hmm. if somebody says, pull your socks up, deal with it. And the other person is in emotional and physical pain. It's not helping either of them. So Mm. there's not a blame here. It's just, you're talking about two different people and two ways of processing it. And it's first acknowledging the difference and then saying, I mean, if we want to continue to live together and support each other, how are we going to do that productively? It's not easy at all. I mean, I can't imagine that. Sometimes I have to push. I mean, I wouldn't say Andrew's a wall person. Mm. He's just more practical and less emotional about things than I am. Sometimes he has to pull me along and say, pull your socks up. (laughs) Um, And that's okay, but we talk about it. Mm. And I know that that, you know, I know for some people that's not easy. I, I don't really, other than getting somebody externally who mm. is trained to work with that dynamic to help. Mm. Mm. And I think, I mean, it's interesting what you're saying as well, that um, this idea of getting support outside of the relationship, because I do think sometimes we have this idea that all our support should come from our partner, you know, that somehow there's a sort of exclusivity there um, and an intimacy and a feeling that, you know, it's almost a sort of letting that person down if you go outside of that relationship for help. But I, 
I guess there are times when you really need to do that. Well, and it doesn't necessarily need to be a trained counselor. Mm. I mean, it could be that if you're the one who's falling apart and you have a partner or whoever is your, has been your main support can't dial in to what's going on, it could be a family member. It could be a good friend. I remember when Andrew was going through a clinical trial, it was very frightening for me. And I excused myself from one of his, one of his first treatments. And I went downstairs. I remember mm. this clearly at MD Anderson. I called my mom and I uh, broke into yeah. tears and I said, I've got to be strong for Andrew. I've, I feel like I've got to yeah. be there for him. And it's so hard. And just having somebody other than the person who is going through this, mm. it's a trauma. It's hard can sometimes just really, you know, like a good cry or throw a pillow or whatever can release some of that anxiety mm. and having somebody else who can just listen, just mm. be able to listen to you. And I, I've been through all those different scenarios along the way. I have children who listen. Mm. It's very good. Yeah. yeah. Cause I think sometimes of course um, it can happen the other way as well, where the, the partner, like you said about feeling strong and all the rest of it can be quite difficult for the partner. I think sometimes mm -hmm. as well, like, Maybe, for example, people forget, forget to ask how they are doing. They're only interested in how the one with the cancer is doing. I mean, right, right. Well, and um, that that has happened. That does happen. And I don't know. Maybe it's just the kind of personality I am. I will sometimes say, "Hey, <laughs> what about me? You yeah. know, this is this is hard." And sometimes I've had to seek out people that I know I'm close to or a family member or even a counselor on my own to just say, this is what I'm feeling right now. So I, I really believe that both people or all the people involved in a serious chronic illness, especially, are going to mm. go through different stages. And I think mm -hmm. it's a lot, it takes a lot of self-awareness about what you need as an individual and being willing to look outside yourself. What, did, what, are the, what does the other person need? Mm. Yeah, no, that's right. And I guess one of the things which is often a big difference, we've sort of hinted at this before, is the amount of knowledge people want. So some people want to just leave it all to the doctors. Mm -hmm. um, other people want to become practically a PhD in the subject themselves mm -hmm. um, and, you know, get so involved that they get perhaps heavily involved in one of the patient groups or whatever. Um, so, you know, how do you navigate that? And I mean, I guess in some relationships, it'll be one person will take that responsibility to yep. educate themselves um, rather than both. And, and you must have seen a lot of families like that. Yeah. And it's all over the map. You're absolutely right, uh, Adrian. It is all over the map. Um, I would say the only, the only, you know, somebody, <laughs> it doesn't matter if it's the patient or it's the carer or it's a fa another family member or friend, somebody, in, in, since we're talking about CLL especially, yeah. somebody needs to be the researcher and the one who's on top of what's going on only because it's not a stagnant situation in terms of treating the, the disease. Mm. Um, and uh, dealing with it, maintaining it, maintaining a, a healthy lifestyle. Somebody has to take that on because it's not, you have CLL, we're going to do X, then we're going to do Y, then we're going to do Z. So that's easy, A, B, C, done. It's just not like that. So because, and wonderfully, it's because it's changing all the time and there are all these new treatments and there are clinical trials and there's all kinds of, frankly, good stuff to help somebody with CLL deal with it and go on with their, with the other parts of their life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't think you can pressure somebody who doesn't want to do research into doing research. Sometimes I've seen what works to say, okay, you go do your thing, live your life. I'll figure it out. I'll, I'll find out when we go to a doctor's appointment, I'll have the list of questions. If you've got something you want to get asked, will ask it. But again, that's different people are wired differently, but I do feel really strongly somebody <laughs> has to stay on top of what are the questions. It's not so much being a PhD, but what are the questions you have to ask yeah. in order to move forward in helping make decisions? Unless you want to just say, here I am, doc, yeah. you make the decisions. And I can't say that that's a bad scenario. But I it think... depends who the doctor is, I suppose. That's the other challenge, isn't that? Because I think one of the things that, yes. you know, I know we feel quite strongly in the community often is that, 
you know, it's really important that, that you see someone who's an expert in your particular type of blood cancer rather than yeah. just a generalist or certainly an oncologist who you yeah. actually may know a lot less than you could find out on, say, Patient Power website. Right, right, right. Well, I think that's right. Um, I don't think that there is one source of all the information you mm. need to know about your health. But I also think that's true when somebody isn't diagnosed with something serious. We now have the blessing and the curse of the internet and Googling something can be great or it can be really terrible because there's a lot of stuff out there that's just baloney. Um, but somebody in the circle of what's going on needs to do what we, what I, what Andrew and I have talked about, sort of triangulating information. You kind of, somebody needs to go out and look at what a bunch of different sources are saying mm -hmm. and then have a specialist who knows about all these different things, but is specializes in CLL to be able to say, okay, I'm hearing this or I'm hearing that, or what about this? So that you can come to a plan that intuitively makes sense to you that, that the patient can deal with and feels knowledgeable about so you know what's going on. And I think that that will then flow over to the care partner or the carer. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, no, that does make sense. And how do you think people can handle it if they sort of realize that they're not seeing somebody who's an expert? I mean, what's, what's your thoughts on that? Because sometimes people end up, you know, being offered things and then perhaps they read, oh, that doesn't quite match up with what I'm being told, you know? That's the triangulating. And it's perfectly fair. I mean, I think there are a lot of people who think, oh my God, I don't want to insult my doctor. You know, he's been my doctor for 50 years, 20 years, whatever. I don't want to insult him. But the truth is, you know, it's your life. It's, it's you and it's how your life impacts the people who love you. And I think it's not hard these days with all of the communication and forums like what you have, Adrian, Patient Power, the CLL Society, all of these other resources where people have been down this road before, it's very clear where the specialists are. Mm. And they're all, they're, you know, I just don't think there's an excuse for not finding somebody who, who sees this condition regularly mm. and is up reasonably up on what's coming what are the next things that are possible so i think you sort of have to put away ego or afraid of hurting egos and say what's going to be best for me what mm. what's gonna mm. what's gonna help keep me healthy and mm. you know if your doctor's upset too well, bad kind of thing. yeah too bad. yeah so this is i suppose you know patient power comes in here a little bit doesn't it and advocacy That's and um how would you talk to somebody who feels perhaps a sort of more old school approach to doctors where it's like, oh, you know, they know, doctor knows best. I think it's more, well, the way that, and I've had this conversation with a number of people. I don't, that conversation about, you know, I think I need to see a specialist doesn't have to be adversarial. I mean, we actually, we did go through that early on. There was a primary care doctor who helped diagnose what was going on for Andrew. And as we read about the diagnosis, by talking to people like you, by talking to people in forums, other people who had found a specialist, we came to this internist and said, you know what? We really feel like we need a consultation. The three of us, the doctor, the patient, the carer, we feel a need to talk with somebody who sees this condition more often. We want you involved in the conversation if you want to be involved in it, but I think it's it's a consultation rather than goodbye. We don't want to see you ever again um, because you don't know what you're doing, but it's more, we need more information and we, we'd we like, you know, you're welcome to be involved in that. And so I think the idea of it's not so much uh, blowing off your generalist doctor, it's more of we need more information and we hope you'll come along with us to get it. Mm, mm. And how, how, I mean, how pushy do you need to be sometimes though? I mean, what happens if the doctor says no and gets offended? What, what would you do then? Get a different doctor. Yeah. That's inexcusable. Yeah. And, and I've talked to people who that's happened. They've gone and they said, don't bother. The doctor has said, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm the doctor, you're the patient. 
if you don't like what I'm saying, go get another doctor. Yeah. Well, they said it themselves, they haven't I? <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. But, I, you know, I really hope, Adrian, that there are fewer and fewer doctors. Mm. Now, I, I, with all due respect, I don't know how different the situation is in the UK and in other mm. countries. You know, in the US, there's definitely been a sort of a drumbeat evolution of younger physicians, younger oncologists coming in who get the idea of dialogue rather than yeah. I'm the doctor, you're the patient. Old yeah. school, new school, whatever. But we also have a lot of very bold patients and patient advocates right. and carer advocates who are saying, we're not going to do that model anymore. Yeah. So yeah. change it, it, there is a partnership, or, isn't it, that needs yeah, to happen? It is and a it, and it's funny because sometimes it can be frustrating the other way because, I mean, one of the things at the moment, I'm um, specifically in CLL is quite interesting, is this whole business about what do you do first line? And it increasingly, uh, yeah. seems, it increasingly seems like, you know, for most people, it's a choice. Well, there's other options, but let's just make it simple for a minute between Venita Clax or a Brutinib. And there are pros and cons of each. Um, mm -hmm. And often um, I'm hearing from some people that they go to the doctor and they say, well, what do I do? And the doctor more or less says, we'll do whatever, you know, toss a coin. And it's like, it would be helpful to have a bit more guidance sometimes, that even if it's a question of, look, here's the pros of this one. Here's the pros of that one. Here's the cons of this one. And here's the cons of that one. But that takes a bit of time sometimes. And and I guess that's where sometimes a website like yours or other websites, mm -hmm. people can actually get some knowledge so that they, they then know the questions to ask their doctors. And there can be that's individual right. reasons that make a, a difference to one individual patient or the other. But, you know, it, it, I don't know which is worse, really. The doctor says you must take Ibrucinib because I think that's the best drug. Or the other one who says you must take Venetoclax because I think that's the best drug. Or the one that says, I don't have a clue. Take whichever one you want. I mean, what's worse as a patient, really? Uh, they all have their drawbacks. I mean, and all of them, they're not getting in a dialogue yeah. with the patient and there's not the opening for what you just described. There isn't the opening for, well, let's get another opinion. Mm -hmm. Let's talk to somebody else. Let's look at another source because I mean, <laughs> I don't, well, it's not a good analogy, but there are other situations in life where before you make a major decision, buying a house, buying a car, Deciding yeah. to have another child, um, choosing a school for your kids. I mean, in all these other situations, usually you don't say it's either A or it's B and that's it. You kind of say, well, let me do a little research. Let's talk to some people who've been down the road before. And then you have a dialogue with your doctor. Mm -hmm. And if the doctor's like, well, I don't know, then either you change doctors or you bring somebody else in that can say, well, here are the pros, here are the cons. Here's your situation. Yeah. Here are some choices. And ultimately, sometimes it is the patient who has to make the choice. And that's hard. That's hard. Yeah. That like there are two or three choices. They all have pros and cons. Yes. Yeah. I have to make peace with the decision that gets made. Yeah. It, you have to say in it, but I think a patient needs to be educated enough to feel comfortable with that decision. Yeah. And if I remember your sort of story correctly, because I was able to interview your husband a while ago mm -hmm. now, um, you know, there's been a couple of moments where you've had together had to make some quite sort of courageous decisions, let's say, or, or, or sort of, you know, not, not slightly thinking out of the box at the time. Am I, am I right in that? Well, as entering clinical trials, mm -hmm. you know, the choice to enter a clinical trial many years ago, um, you know, now it's out of date. It was an FCR uh, mm -hmm. choice 10 years before it became the standard. And now what it's almost passe. I mean, not passe. I know there mm. are people where it's the right yeah. choice, but it's less the first line choice yeah. now than no, it was sure. say five, 10 years yeah, ago. No, that's right. And that's true even in the UK. I mean, until quite recently, um, FCR was pretty much the only thing that most people were getting in the UK, unless they had very specific markers. Mm -hmm. But just in the last few months, um, they, they've um, approved Venetoclax and abinutuzumab, and that's often being used first line now um, for people in the UK and, and I think other parts of Europe as well. Interestingly, right. not so much a brutinib first line, that tends to be second or third line, but, but you know, it's just interesting the way these things work out and, and, and it changes so quickly, doesn't it? So yesterday's well, but experimental oh, treatment. Is today, yeah, right. And I, I want to be clear, many years ago, FCR gave Andrew and us who love him 17 year remission. Wow. And then he was amazing. retreated. So, and he was retreated with um, Gaziva. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, I should know what I, 
need to know what the non-commercial name for it is. But anyway, he was retreated and now has gone on. So I don't want to bad mouth what was great then. It, yeah. it created a great bit of life for us, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, but it is, um, it's a little bit hard to keep up because yeah. the, the field is changing so quickly and there are more choices. I mean, we've talked with, you know, we talk to experts all the time and they go through this list of, well, yeah. there's this and this, or we're we trying this, this and that. And, you know, and cost comes into it and availability. And so it, I think it takes more than just one or two people to make that decision. You really have to have a conversation with a physician yeah. you trust to say, you know, what's gonna be right for me. Yeah, and any thoughts about the whole process of a clinical trial? Because I know for some people that can be a, a very scary thing. Was that quite scary for you? Um, it, it gave me pause. Oh. Um, and especially when they hand you the thing of papers with a big black box. I don't know if they still have the big black box. It is a little scary, but I think there's some myths around it, which of course, you know, patient power, we've done some myth busting series about it. You're not a guinea pig. You're yeah. not gonna be given a placebo. You're not gonna be given nothing. At minimum, you're given the standard of care. So you might not get the experimental drug combo or whatever, you'll get what is normally given at the time. Yeah. But, and it's also an incredibly controlled situation. So if it's, if you get the experimental drug, you're helping move science forward. And if something's not going right, they're there. You're like so well monitored in a clinical trial that if it's something's not going quite right, you get taken off it and you go to another treatment. So I think there's a lot of mythology around being in a clinical trial that needs to be busted regularly. Mm -hmm. Mm. But the other caveat is not everybody's re not everybody is right for a clinical trial. That's why yeah. this whole thing of well, Susie was in that clinical trial. I want to be in it. That's nice. You can ask, but your profile may not mean that it's a good match for you yeah. at the moment. So we're very big advocates for getting educated about clinical trials and could there be something right? And that again has to be a dialogue with your doctor. Say, you know, I've yeah. heard about this. Do you know about it? Is it right for me? Yeah. But yeah, the, the fear factor is going to be there. I mean, it's the fear factor of having a bone marrow biopsy. Yeah. Yeah. That scared me as much as it's scary. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Like, yeah. Cause I had to be there once when it happened and like, but it's, the reality, I think, you I don't know if you had one, the reality seems to be a little less bad than the anticipation of what it actually is and how it feels. Mm -hmm. It's not pleasant. That's often, yeah, that's often true yeah. for a lot of things in yeah. life, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. It but, is. yeah, and I think, I suppose the other thing from a clinical trial perspective is it's not everyone's personality to allow a no. computer to make that choice. And that's fine. I mean, for some people, it's, it's a bit of a relief if they're not sure what to do. And and as you say, it's very important to know that you're happy with both arms if you're going, or all three arms if you're going to go into a, a trial, that you know, you, you're you not going to cry if you get the thing you don't want, because if that's the case, you probably shouldn't be in the trial already. Well, I know that's happened recently outside of CLL with the uh, COVID vaccines. We have a number mm -hmm. of friends who said, I'll be in a clinical trial for one of these. And there was a 50-50 chance in that yeah. case that they would get a placebo. Yeah. So no harm, no foul, right? Yeah. It's kind of the same thing with a clinical trial in cancer because you're going to get treated. You obviously mm. need treatment if you're going in a clinical trial. So at minimum, you're going to yeah. get the standard. And then yeah. it's a question of being comfortable with, are you comfortable with an ex experimental, but it's controlled experimental. It's not... Yeah. It's not like, oh, let's just pull this out of the air and see what it is. There's been two or three phases yeah. ahead of that to make sure that it's safe, that it's yeah. not going to kill you, and that it's not going to have some really untoward side effects. I mean, that's the way I understand human yeah. clinical trials. No, it's at sure. a point yeah. where either it's going to help or it's not going to help. Yeah, no, that's right. And it'll have yeah. gone through a lot of, you know, research before it gets it gets gets into the clinic as well. So Yeah, but yeah. it may not be right for some people and that's yeah. okay. You know, yeah. there are people who are risk averse and that's there's risk in anything, yeah. but this particular scenario may not be right for someone. 
yeah. or yeah, that care partner. <laughs> so, yeah, no, and I guess that's the thing, isn't it? I mean, I, it's like, like what you're saying is that the good news for many, not just for CLL actually, but many of the other blood cancers at, at the moment is that there is more than one treatment often. You know, even if the first thing doesn't work, there's often other things that can, that can come along. So it's kind of, it's important not to invest too much into any one treatment, I think, isn't it? Um, I think that's right. The, you know, it's one of those, I, I think it follows along with any cancer diagnosis. You have to kind of look at where are you right now in your particular journey in, yeah. and, and which of the menu of things in consultation with your doctor, which is the right one right now. What yeah. I do know uh, is that I'm ha we're having a lot of conversations uh, with people who have had CLL for some period of time, they've been treated and they're looking at their sort of plan B. Okay, so mm. I've been treated, I'm in a, uh, maybe a complete remission or a partial remission, I'm living my life. What do I need to know about when I need to be treated again? Because yeah. the landscape continues to change. Yes. So that's where the sort of ongoing lifelong education comes in. Somebody yeah. should be looking at what if the other shoe drops again? You yeah. know, what, 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 do I, what do I need to know about those changes and those options? Yeah. And the challenge, of so, course, is it can change, you know, just in a matter of, of months, can't it? You can think you're on top of it all. And then six months later, something else comes along, which is exciting. It's a good place to be in many yeah. ways because it's it's all about progress and development isn't it yeah yep it is it really is and that's the thing that you kind of go back to school when you have an uh, have a condition like this um i you know maybe i'm a silver lining kind of person but what i've observed with cll and some of the other chronic cancers and there are a few of them is at least you have the time usually to do the study yeah. to look at what's out there, to have those discussions. In an acute situation, you really do have to have more trust that a, if a decision has to be made quickly, that you're with a doctor who knows a physician, a medical team yeah. who knows you got this choice, this choice, this one isn't right for you. We really need to go do this. And you have to be comfortable with just going with it. With CLL, usually you have a little bit of time to absorb that, have the conversations and become knowledgeable and comfortable with what the choice is. Yeah, no, for sure. And I, I guess that's that's obviously a, an advantage for sure. Um, but it also sometimes gives you longer to worry about things too. Let's Absolutely. Be Absolutely, it does. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Absolutely you know, there's, there's no time to worry sometimes in the more acute setting. Almost. It's just yeah. like you get the diagnosis and, oh, by the way, we're going to start treating this afternoon. You know, it's like. I hadn't thought about it that way, but you're absolutely right. Um, you know, I, I can also say that I have a tremendous amount of empathy mm. for both uh, uh, patients and their carers and care partners who go through the uh, let's just watch and wait, watch and worry period, because we mm. did that for four years. And every time Andrew would go for a blood test, three days before I was a wreck. And, mm. you know, Mr. Practical was, we'll go, we'll find out what's going on and we'll go yeah. from there. Um, mm. So I think you're right. And I just share that because that's a pretty, I think I've been told <laughs> it's a pretty normal reaction because you're yeah. anticipating the worst and you have all this time to worry about it. So how do you deal with that? And I mean, eventually over time, over all those years, I got to the point, I was like, okay, blood test is coming up. I'm worried about it. Here's the box. Put it in the box. I'm I'm going to worry when I have to worry, you know, because right now worrying isn't doing me any good. Mm. And, you know, I continue to live that way because we're now both, you know, in a situation where we're dealing with two different cancer conditions. And it's... Um, so you've got your own diagnosis, then, do you? No. Andrew oh. is dealing with myelofibrosis. Oh, right. Well. Yes, of course. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, yeah, no, no. So I, I share that. that. Yeah. No, no, that's okay. So, I mean, I share that because I could spend all my days worrying about what's next. Mm -hmm. And so could he, because it's a lot of balancing act, but you know, if there was, I don't know if it's advice, it's like, face it, know what you're worried about, then find some kind of a mental box put it over there, talk to somebody about it and then go on with your life yeah. because 
the worrying before you have to worry is not going to help. And it took me a long time to internalize that. I'm going to worry when I need to. <laughs> mm. But I guess there are times when you take that box down and look at it deliberately as well to make it easier to put that box up. Absolutely. And I guess that's partly where the therapy can come in. And You got it. Exactly. It's almost like making an appointment with yourself. This is now my time to worry so that I don't have to worry, you know. That's an interesting tomorrow. way of thinking about it. Sure, sure. And I mean, I think some people do that through daily meditation, you know, or, mm -hmm. or um, yoga where you can get to a place where you can kind of let your mind do what it's going to do, go to that place and then go to another place where now I'm going to go on and live my life today. And then I'm going to live my life tomorrow. And it, it's a, I think it's a skill. And, you know, and some of us can do it better than others. I mean, for me, my anxiety meant I needed to have help. So yeah. I take medication every day. And it doesn't mean I'm not ever anxious. I am, but it helps me to process that anxiety so I'm not saying better living through drugs at all I'm saying every yeah. person is different and there are these different tools that I think people need to consider it's what because, works for the individual isn't it I guess exactly exactly I think so I think so yeah no, it's been wonderful to talk to you and I'm conscious that okay. we've chatted quite a while and yeah. uh, that you got up nice and early so that we, I wouldn't have to stay up too Fresh. late. <laughs> there we are. So, um, yeah, so it's been great to talk. And uh, I don't know if you've, you know, anything else sort of burning on your mind that you'd like to say to people just as we come to an end that you know, um, perhaps could have covered, covered but didn't. No, I, I just think that the real takeaway that I've learned over all these years is that it's really, really important to listen, mm. to listen to the, if you're a carer, to listen to where the person who is living the condition is. And it's equally important to encourage the, the patient, the survivor, the, what, the thriver, whoever, to listen to what the carer needs. Mm. Because if you don't have that dialogue, you can't be a team because it's a team, it is a team sport. And I know there'll be family members who won't know what to say or do it's really okay to tell them what you need. Mm. You know, they'll say, how can we help? Well, say right now, there's nothing you can do to help other than just listen and just be there. Give me a hug when there's no pandemic. Or it's really okay to say, you know what? I just don't feel like cooking this week or he's not feeling well or she's not feeling well. If you're willing to order some food or come clean the house, whatever. My point mm. is, it's that being able to listen to what somebody needs and to be able to react and do whatever you can do to make the situation doable and possible so well thank you very much esther and i you know sure. encourage people to go and look at uh, patient power and all the wonderful thank resources you. you've got there and um thanks for all you do for, for well, you and their family members so. <laughs> <laughs> well you too you're building a wonderful community adrian and please encourage your listeners and your community that you know if there's any question that they have they're welcome to reach out to me as well okay. um you know yeah. at patient power we have comments at patientpower.info mm -hmm. if you need guidance of what information we have i'm happy to help yeah well wonderful thank you very much i'll thank I'll you i'll let you go Esther. thank okay. you okay thanks a lot okay then